June 1992, the Earth Summit, Rio de Janeiro. Representatives of a large number of countries discuss issues related to environment and development. Issues like preventing deforestation, promoting sustainable agriculture, nurturing biodiversity, protecting the atmosphere, and conserving natural resources while combating poverty. 108 governments adopt significant resolutions. India is one of them. One thing that's quite specific to India is the fact that it is the world's largest democracy, um, which brings a very different flavour to how things operate as opposed to maybe more authoritarian regimes. India, over the course of the last 20 years, has been making big strides as regards decentralization, effectively harnessing through village level institutions the people's voice. For instance, in the Himalayas, in the North Indian state of Uttaranchal. The Himalayas, home to hardy rural mountain communities and home to some of the richest deciduous, temperate and pine forests. Forests where large-scale commercial logging was once rampant. But things changed in 1973. It happened near Gopeshwar. Villagers, mostly women, rose up in protest when this particular forest became the target of the loggers. This triggered off a mass movement which came to be known as Chipko. Saraswati Devi had participated actively in the protest. She was 17 years old then. In the next decade, Chipko spread rapidly to other parts of the northern Himalayas. In over a dozen separate incidents, villagers successfully stopped felling operations. The government responded positively. It imposed a 15-year ban on commercial felling of green trees above a thousand meters. Then, in 1996, the Supreme Court of India prohibited forest departments from harvesting wood in most forests in the country. But commercial logging is not the only reason for environmental degradation. A confrontation between forest guards and an illicit woodcutter. Such incidents were common in the protected forests around Parivadu, a village in the southern Indian state of Tamil Nadu. Illegal felling of trees by the poor was not the only issue. Villagers would also bring their animals for grazing to the forest. This caused further degradation. The guards found it impossible to protect the forest. Gradually, the wooded area shrunk. The hillsides started looking barren. But a few years ago, things began to change. A new government program called Joint Forest Management helped villagers establish their own forest committee. This new body got funding from the state government. Armed with an organization and resources of their own, villagers planted new saplings and constructed small water harvesting structures. Technical inputs were provided by the forest department. Gradually, the forest started regenerating, and the village forest committee took on the responsibility of protecting it. Violators were systematically fined. Sir, cutle, adu, madu, vidu, kudan, sunna ga. Adu, yari ga, vadi, mana pilli le, madu, mai le, aral ko ina ra, vadi nor la, abdi solte, vadi nu bana malai ge. So the same villagers who had once degraded their forest are now protecting it. This change is all because of joint forest management. It allows village people to collect non-timber products freely from the forest. And since they now have a stake in it, they take interest in protecting it. They thus have become partners with the Forest Department. Indian Forest Service started in 18, 
64. So it has a strong capacity, strong tradition, and uh, a very strong ethos, let's say, for over 100 years, 140 years, that started out protecting with the ideal of protecting forests, not thinking in terms of, let's say, forest as a livelihood for people. That idea, of course, has been evolving for a long time, but the acceleration of that new thinking has really picked up pace in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, particularly since about 1990 with the joint forest management uh, movement. And I think at the moment, it probably, as a concept, is probably evolving faster than ever. It's interesting, FAO did a, uh, a study that just came out in, a, in book form uh, called In Search of Excellence on Forest Management in Asia and the Pacific, both developed and, and uh, developing countries. And there were, they were looking at 174 different cases that different countries or different individuals suggested, and 40 of those cases were in India. They eventually got that down to 28 cases that came out in book form, and of the 28, three are in India. Community participation can take many forms. The West Garo Hills in northeast India offers an interesting case study. More than 60% of this ecologically vibrant area is covered by dense forests. But there is reason for concern. Villagers, rooted in centuries of tradition, practice jhum or slash and burn farming. What they do is to clear portions of the forest periodically. They cultivate such land for a few years till it loses all its fertility. The villagers then move to another part of the forest and start another felling operation. Today, with the population rising rapidly, deforestation has become a significant issue. But how can farmers be weaned away from Joom? This is precisely what the government is now exploring. A new program has helped villagers form their own microcredit groups. Members can now take loans and start small enterprises. Enterprises like vegetable farming, cattle rearing, and setting up small grocery shops. Village groups have also started implementing their own infrastructure projects. Projects like roads and culverts, bridges and causeways. Villages that were once isolated are gradually getting connected to main roads, to bigger markets. These initiatives have boosted the villagers' incomes. Now they are more amenable to suggestions that they should reduce their dependence on Joom. From the northeast to the far west, this is the Thar Desert. And right in the middle of this vast arid wasteland and steeped in history is Mohangar. Mohangar is also the headquarters of one of the ecological task forces of India's territorial army. Its mission, to stabilize sand dunes and green large parts of the desert. The territorial army consists only of retired soldiers who have been re-employed. In just six years, they have planted nearly two million saplings. Already, large tracts of barren lands are now covered with semi-mature forests. The ecological task force of the Indian Army has been active in five areas in the country. It has planted more than 31 million trees and brought around 74,000 hectares under forest cover. These, for instance, are the forests that one of the battalions raised in the lower Himalayas 
near Dehradun. Illegal quarrying was once widespread in this area. It was later banned because of public pressure. And today, if the same slopes look green, it's all because of the army. The Silent Valley in southern India. A treasure trove of biodiversity with more than a thousand species of flowering plants, 211 species of birds, 128 of butterflies. There are 107 varieties of orchids, 325 of fungi, as well as a significant number of tree species endemic to the valley. And then, there is the precious wildlife. For instance, there are just four species of giant squirrels in the world. And this one, the Malabar giant squirrel, which grows to a length of more than a meter, is found here. The Silent Valley is now a part of the 5,340 square kilometer Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. Restrictions here are severe and permissions to enter the core area difficult to obtain. Biosphere reserves are significant gene pools of terrestrial and coastal ecosystems, which are internationally recognized within the framework of UNESCO's Man in the Biosphere program and collectively constitute a world network comprising of about 459 biosphere reserves in 97 countries. Biosphere reserves are designed to meet one of the most challenging issues that the world is facing in the 21st century, that is, how can we conserve the diversity of plants, animals and microorganisms which make up our living biosphere? Protection works, but it cannot be at the cost of people's livelihoods. Take the case of the Gulf of Mannar, near the southern tip of India. Rich in marine diversity and bioresources, it is a repository of over 3,600 species of flora and fauna. As many as 128 varieties of coral reefs are found here. However, till a few years ago, this invaluable ecosystem was under threat. Large-scale commercial mining and bottom trawling were degrading the coral reefs. Not anymore. Today, the Gulf of Mannar is a declared biosphere reserve. The core area, consisting of 21 islands, is protected and nobody is permitted to within 10 meters of the islands. This has affected the lives of many poor people who are dependent on marine resources for their incomes. And that's why the reserve has initiated a project which explores other livelihood options. Implemented by the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation and supported by the United Nations Development Program, this project has helped communities pick up new skills and manage their own pearl culture unit, a fish pickle factory, and an agar producing plant. Lessons from this pilot project will be useful in replicating the program. Another initiative targets fishermen. The foundation's village resource center accesses satellite-based information on potential fishing areas in the Gulf. Every day, this information is relayed to fishermen. They then use their global positioning systems to reach precisely those areas. This is helping them increase their catch. Yet another project involves introducing specially designed artificial reefs into the water. And how has marine life responded to these man-made structures? Amateur underwater footage indicates that the outlook is positive. India has been active in promoting the biosphere reserve concept in the country. With a variety of situations within the country, recognition has been given to 13 biosphere reserves. Almost an equal number of biosphere reserves are under active consideration of the Government of India is indicative of the importance attached to this approach towards biodiversity conservation and management. Protecting livelihoods and nurturing the ecosystem can often be at loggerheads. The Rajaji National Park is a case in point. Located in the Himalayan foothills, 
This 820 square kilometer park is home to endangered species such as the elephant and the tiger. Till a few years ago, traditional pastoral communities lived in small hamlets right in the middle of the park. These were the Vanguchas. Their cattle, estimated to be more than 10,000 in number, grazed all over. This left little for other grass-dependent animals and threatened their very survival, as also the survival of carnivores that now had a reduced supply of prey. Today, the situation has changed. The Vangujas have been convinced to relocate to areas outside the park. They have been given fertile agricultural land so that they can sustain themselves by farming. They now have access to safe drinking water. And their children, who once looked after animals, now go to schools set up close to their new settlements. The process of relocation started three years ago. Already, vast degraded grasslands have regenerated. And there are signs that the wildlife here has responded positively to the improved habitat. Abhishek Harihar and Amit John Kurian are postgraduate students at the Wildlife Institute of India. They have been rigging up camera traps all over the Rajaji National Park. The students now have a number of photographs of tigers, civets and leopards. But it is this muddy, grainy photograph that has surprised them. What was the Himalayan black bear, a high-altitude animal, doing down in the foothills? We've got this picture of the black bear and it gives a good idea that uh, food for the and this high altitude animal is found in this region now and that it is actually coming down to this region to feed and then I suppose it goes back as well. We're not saying that it's because of the Vangujas leaving that there is enough food for the animals but just that it is a possibility. This is a possibility that will only be confirmed in the years to come and if it does it will demonstrate that India's wildlife policies have been effective here. Plovers and sandpipers, gulls, and terns, herons, and egrets. The Chilika Lake supports as many as 151 species of birds, and 92 of them are long distance migrants, some from places as far away as Siberia. Chilika, the largest lagoon on the east coast of India, is yet another highly productive ecosystem. Yet, Chilika, till recently, was dying. One reason was the siltation brought about by the 52 rivers that empty themselves into the lake. As a result, the mouth connecting the lake to the sea was getting choked up. Gradually, the lake reduced in size and there was an alarming drop in salinity. In 1993, Chilika had the dubious distinction of making its entry into the Montreux record. The Chilika Development Authority carried out a detailed analysis of the situation. One major intervention was to open up an artificial mouth and carry out extensive desiltation. This improved the lake's linkage with the sea. Local communities were also trained to make their own water harvesting structures. These structures collect rainwater for the villagers' use. They also trap a lot of silt that would otherwise have entered the lake. Gradually, the lake got revitalized. The 30-odd monitoring stations set up by the Chilika Development Authority showed healthier levels of salinity, nutrient content, and dissolved oxygen. The initiative vis-a-vis -vis, uh, opening of the another mouth and uh, dredging of the channel has resulted in uh, the maintenance of the salinity in this particular lagoon, which was very important. And uh, based on that, as we understand, the results are quite positive. The fish production has gone high and uh, other uh, species uh, are also doing well and what we understand is that the bird population is also has increased. Today, fishermen have higher incomes 
because there are more fish in the lake. And what is very significant, the number of Iravadi dolphins here is on the rise. In 2002, the lagoon was removed from the Montro record and the Chilika Development Authority received the Ramsar Award. From fragile ecosystems to fragile monuments. Located in the North Indian city of Agra is the Taj Mahal, an inspiring blend of Persian style and Indian craftsmanship. Yet in the early 80s, this heritage monument was under threat. The magnificent white marble exterior was turning black in places. In 1984, M.C. Mehta, a lawyer, filed a case before the Supreme Court. His argument? Industrial pollution was responsible for the degradation of the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal was under serious threat because of the Mathra refinery, chemical industries, foundries, brick kilns, and so many other industries located over there. The Supreme Court ruled in his favor. Around 225 coal-based industries were forced to shut down. This thermal power generation plant, located in the heart of the city, was entirely dismantled and decommissioned. Over 450 brick kiln units had to shut shop and relocate. And major industrial units, like this refinery, installed elaborate pollution control devices, even though they were 50 kilometers away from the monument. Atmospheric pollution dropped dramatically. The threat to the Taj receded. The Supreme Court has, uh, in fact, undertaken not only to save the Taj, which is the, uh, one of the wonders uh, of the world, and also the people of that area, and also set an example that, look, this is what the people can do, and this is what the people can expect from a, uh, the courts of the country. And also, this can be done by the government, if you really want that the government should do it. An area in which India has been particularly active has been in the role of the judiciary, of the courts, both in terms of Supreme Court as well as with the state level high courts and even below that at different levels. The judiciary, the courts, have often forced the pace on environmental issues and in fact some people have even criticized them as being environmental activists. How then are progressive enterprises adapting to this new scenario? Located in Gajrola in northern India is this colossus, Jubilant Organosis. This distillery, the largest in Asia, produces around 250,000 litres of industrial alcohol daily. Jubilant Organosis also churns out as much as 3 million litres of effluence daily. This is its massive effluent treatment plant. It works around the clock in order to ensure that the final discharge is in line with the requirements stipulated by the Pollution Control Board. But where is all the treated effluent being released? Jubilant was aware that this discharge, organic in nature, had soil enriching nutrients. It could be useful to farmers. Today, the treated effluent is stored in 28 lagoons around a kilometer from the plant. From here, it is distributed to over 1,600 farmers in 12 villages. Land productivity has improved and there is less of need for chemical fertilizers. Jubilant organosis is big. It has the resources to deal with pollution. But what about the small and micro enterprises? The vibrant textile cluster in Balotra, in the northwestern state of Rajasthan, is a case in point. There are around a thousand small enterprises in and around Balotra. 
They provide employment to more than 70,000 men and women. They also discharge a lot of effluence. Entrepreneurs in Balutra can hardly afford dedicated effluent treatment plants. So, how are they responding to the regulatory authorities? Pollution Control Board is very strict in these days. And they want to get out of the water from 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 the water. और कॉमन ट्रीटमेंट प्लांट की योजना के लिए वो बहुत ही प्रगतिशील है और काम जुट एक जुट होकर के कर रहे हैं। This is the common effluent treatment plant that is coming up in Balutra. The entrepreneurs have come together and arranged 50% of the costs. The balance has been provided by the government as a part of a special scheme, a scheme that has helped reduce pollution and save a lot of valuable jobs. Meanwhile, the high growth story in India continues, and with growth has come the inevitable urbanization, the inevitable automobiles and the inevitable pollution. Some of India's big cities are among the most polluted in the world. Here again, the regulatory authorities have had to step in and take some concrete measures. For instance, oil companies have been directed to supply petrol that is free of lead. Then. Every owner has to put his or her vehicle through a periodic test and get a certificate that emissions are within the prescribed limits. In addition, all new cars sold in 11 major cities have to conform to Euro 2 emission norms and will soon have to be Euro 3 compliant. But the real key lies in the efficient forms of public transport. They use less fuel per person and hence do not pollute as much. This, for instance, is Delhi's mass rapid transit system. Already operational in some parts of the city, it will help decongest the capital's choked arteries and reduce pollution levels. Authorities in Delhi have taken one more effective step in response to another Supreme Court verdict. They have forced the highly polluting taxis and buses to switch to compressed natural gas or CNG. CNG is far less polluting than diesel. All these changes have made a big difference to the quality of air in Delhi. Between 2001 and 2002, sulfur dioxide levels at busy intersections fell by 36%, while those of carbon monoxide fell by 22%. In December 2004, the Asian edition of Time did a story on pollution in Asian cities. The magazine observed, Delhi has shown that strong government intervention, backed by environmental activism, can make a difference. Protecting the atmosphere, preventing deforestation, nurturing biodiversity. These are issues that the developed world did not have to cope with on its road to prosperity. But times have changed. India has to be more sensitive about the ecosystem while it gets on to its own high growth trajectory. Nevertheless, India is learning that given the right policies, increasing incomes and nurturing the environment can take place side by side. And that people, even those in remote areas, can become active participants in this process.